a little bit of background. Um, last year uh, at DEPCON, um, we had a panel uh, about what could go wrong. And uh, it basically tried to ask the question if this, this blockchain thing here uh, is like technically successful, um, what could nevertheless go wrong to, to make it a, um, well, to make it a net a negative uh, for, for society. So we tried to discuss uh, risks. Uh, Joe, Joe was, was uh, on the panel as well. And, and part of this uh, panel then, uh, well, the, the question came up, um, how to measure success, or uh, in other words, um, what is the metric uh, about society um, that should change in a positive way if, if we are successful? So wh wh why, why are we doing this, <laughs> basically? Um, I start a little bit probably easier with uh, right now, most apps uh, probably have less users than there are currently um, people in the room. Uh, so are we successful? Um, and if so, well, why are we successful? Or kind of what is the metric that we can currently observe that tells us that we are doing the right thing and that we are successful? Or are we not? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so the blockchain ecosystem is 10 years old. Um, the smart contract ecosystem is arguably five years old. Um, it is incredibly uh, young uh, as a technology and still quite immature as a technology. We, we built uh, what we're considering to be a base trust layer um, and offering it to the world uh, more conceptually than uh, for the world to, to really anchor all of their applications into it yet. Uh, and we're now building out uh, um, DeFi, open finance, uh, financial plumbing for the emerging decentralized economy. Um, and um, technologies take quite a while to uh, develop um, themselves and to, to be adopted. So uh, between when Tim Berners-Lee wrote uh, um, his white paper um, and uh, uh, when there was actual ramification in society, it was at least 10 years. Um, uh, mobile phones took a long time to catch on. Uh, if you remember those old satellite phones and cars took a long time and electricity took a long time. So this is happening remarkably quickly. Uh, when a technology um, first emerges, it's very raw. Uh, you can see the innards of the machine. You, you're, you have to turn the crank yourself, you have to download uh, extensions yourself, you have to deal with the uh, uh, long strings of hexadecimal, um, and we're just getting to the point where we're figuring out user experience, user interface, usability, uh, we're getting to the point where we're figuring out scalability and privacy and confidentiality, so um, right now I think we have to measure um, user adoption by how many developers there are in the space, and, and so I think we're doing incredibly well. Those are the people that are gonna fix all those problems. They're gonna put um, the shell on the machine and, and make it really usable. Um, and I think early on we realized that it's probably gonna go well for a while, but until we hit some extreme friction in society, uh, we won't really know that we've arrived, and so when uh, the term shitcoin is spoken in a congressional hearing. Uh, I think we're, we're starting to, to hit uh, the mainstream in, in terms of awareness. And so uh, I expect it to go fairly smoothly, but uh, that, that's one measure right there that uh, we will get societal pushback. So, so the two metrics I heard is the uh, number of uh, use of the term shitcoin and uh, developers, right? <laughs> in in, uh, in official public settings, yes. Okay. I think the limits of like those kinds of metrics are that like aware one is awareness and the other is people trying to do things, and like it's clear that there that that there is awareness and it's clear that there are people trying to do things. But the thing that uh, I'm more kind of concerned about is uh, is uh, getting from that which I actually feel we have pretty comfortably to people successfully doing things. Like, to what extent is this, like, is this space like, just 
people building products to help people gamble on future usage of the space, which is people, more people building products to help more people gamble on the future of the space, versus like actually providing a, con a concrete value that they, that they would otherwise uh, not have gotten. And, and I, I think there are definitely kind of signs that valuable things are starting to genuinely happen. I and mean, for like some of the more institutional applications are actually starting to be used, like Ethereum being used for just even things like verifying certificates, like that's there, that's happening, and that's a value that you can, and it's not the, the biggest thing, but it's value that you can see fairly easily. Like when I, uh, even just for cryptocurrency itself, when I uh, visited like, Africa and I uh, talked to some people in the local community and I asked like how concretely are people there using blockchain things, and the reply I got is uh, people are, there's just a lot of people that are remotely working for companies based in uh, rich countries, and they're able to work for them, and cryptocurrency just helps them move money to their families for a lot less than the like 15 point whatever percent com uh, commissions you would get with traditional services. So there's things happening that kind of aren't captured as being the rev like, as being clearly the revenue of a particular company dedicated to that thing. And in some ways you should expect that because crypto is supposed to be about re reducing intermediaries. But I, mean, I definitely feel like we're not good at measuring the extents to which those kinds of things you know, are happening now and are close to happening. You're all about measurements and uh, metrics and data uh, at Masari. Uh I don't necessarily know that we're bad at measuring these things. I think that you just might not like the metrics that, that we're ultimately looking at. Uh, you, you know, greed, for lack of a better term, is good, in this industry at least. Um, and traditionally, investments in Bitcoin have led people down the rabbit hole and gotten them more actively involved in the ecosystem. And investments in Ethereum have been speculative in nature by many people that first approach the industry, and then that ultimately leads them further down the rabbit hole. And if you think about the only, in my eyes, three applications of crypto that have hit product market fit, it's money, originally with Bitcoin, which is kind of like a distributed central bank. It's uh, ICOs and distributed crowdfunding, which is kind of like a distributed investment bank. And then more recently, it's lending, uh, which is kind of like a decentralized commercial bank. So. I would look for things like wallet addresses that hold a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand dollars or more worth of these assets as probably the most important metric uh, that the industry should track going forward because as that number increases, more people will be fully hook, line and sinker into crypto as an asset class, as an emerging tech space um, because they have to put their money where their mouths are. So the thing that grabbed my attention about blockchain and about Bitcoin originally was not securities law, wasn't what, whether or not the CFTC thinks Bitcoin or Ether is a commodity or not. It was about the notion that we could, I'm a lawyer, a disputes lawyer, um, someone who sued insurance companies for many years. It was the notion that you could create contracts that couldn't be broken. And I think that from my perspective, I think it's too early to apply a um, sort of a financial metric, and maybe my brain doesn't work that way. I'm not, I'm not in the same business um, as the other folks on the panel. But for me, when I start seeing people actually building things that are beyond uh, financial speculation that allow me as a lawyer to confidently automate the performance component of contracts, I feel like we've are people familiar with the book Crossing the Chasm? It's a classic book on entrepreneurship. I feel like we are at, I think there are five stages in Crossing the Chasm. I feel like when you hear shitcoin in Congress, or when you see people in Congress lobbying for or pushing for regu uh, good regulation, useful regulation, I feel like I don't think Bitcoin or sort of crypto writ large, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, and my partners have looked at me funny sometime in the last couple of years, they're like, are you still talking about that Bitcoin thing, right? But I, I don't think it's gonna go away. I think it's too early to know what it's going to be in 20 years. So going back to Joe's observation about technology, um, this, the um, elevator, uh, this is interesting, but the elevator is something that was developed about 50 years before it was actually put into use. And the problem is people kept dying because 
they didn't, they didn't have brakes. So it wasn't until uh, someone patented, somebody actually agreed to license the, the steam brake for elevators that you had the development of high rises. I don't think that anybody, when they created the steam engine, imagined elevators or high rise buildings. And I think what's interesting to me as a lawyer and someone who's interested in technology is trying to imagine future applications. So I can't, I don't think I can define what, it, what is going to be success in 20 years. I think I can, I can predict with some degree of confidence that the technology itself, the notion of decentralized money, the notion of programmable money that is immutable-ish, I, I think that persists. Uh, just when, on, on this note, so on this note of um, uh, well, full, uh, automatically exe executable contracts, so one way I think about, or I well, tend to think about things is uh, the internet brought down um, the cost of um, submitting uh, information uh, by a factor of probably way more than 100, so uh, an information as trivial as I like this photo, like a Facebook like, is now kind of possible to, well, to, to, to share this information, while before you wouldn't send a letter just to s let someone know that you like this photo. Um, with, uh, with, with blockchain, kind of my, cons my, my concept is that we can bring down the cost of uh, transactions, and that could, for example, mean, um, well, just giving someone a share in, in, your, ent uh, in, in, in your venture that could, well, obviously be sending money, kind of a, a broadest term of, um, yeah, yeah, transaction, uh, bring down this cost by a factor of 100, 1,000, and, and probably enable, yeah, f completely new things uh, because this cost has gone so Well, you can imagine, down. for example, um, Jerome Lanier wrote a wonderful book called Who Owns the Future, where he describes both the utopian and a dystopian vision of human data, either being able to monetize your personal data yourself or ha having that personal data being controlled by big companies, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, which I never use, Instagram, and so forth. So the question is, we can imagine a use of the technology that allows you to monetize personal data because the cost has gone down, but we don't know. I, I don't think anybody sitting in this room is going to know what it will look like in 20 years and if it will be a success. But maybe to, to the others, is, is uh, so, bringing down transaction costs an explicit? So one actually, Stephen, wanted to ask about one concrete example. So this isn't a contract between two, between two parties in the traditional sense, right? but it, it's a contract within an organization. Organizations are contracts, right? So the Ethereum Foundation has the majority of its funds, about 600,000 plus Ether, in a, in a four of seven multisig between seven parties that are kind of fairly considered within the foundation to be trusted stakeholders. And it also has a rule that says any one of those seven has the ability to withdraw a maximum of 1,000 ETH per day, so you don't have to incur inco high inconvenience for small transactions, but it protects us from you know, losing everything. So w would this be count as an example of smart contracts being, like, you, being used to do non-trivial interesting things to you? The, so the multi-sig contract is a smart contract? Yeah. But it's the keys are in control of people. Yes. So you have, I was just talking to somebody before, like the, mm -hmm. the interesting part of that mm -hmm. is that you still have to, you said reasonably, you said trusted people. Yeah. So there's still a human component yes. to discerning who's no. trustworthy, who can be trusted with those keys because a multi-sig contract can be an absolute nightmare mm -hmm. if you have the wrong people involved. So I, I would say the... Hmm. That's, it's really no different in a way than having multiple physical keys to unlock a missile silo or to mm -hmm. unlock a vault. There's nothing about that in and of itself. But, but they're usually going to be people who are uh, the counterparties of these agreements that, that you're contemplating. And uh, I think what Vitalik is saying is that the business logic of the agreement is, is unassailable. Hmm. Well, you can do that with your bank. Well, but more, more, more assailable, treasury. But more what, assailable than a guaranteed execution of a smart contract. When you say unassailable, um, help me out. What, what do you mean? Uh, the business logic of that smart contract is codified. Um, you need it, four of seven and no one can withdraw yeah, more exactly. than a thousand. The, the rules that, that they've defined. I, I actually, well, <laughs> agree you. So, so, like, just trying to set up a legal structure, um, probably across continents with seven 
like with, with seven people to say, well, we together want to manage this, this money uh, and we want to give us those rules, that would probably cost you thousands of dollars to set up um, the appropriate legal structure for that. With Ethereum, you can now deploy a multi-sig for 50 cents or something like that. But you can't deploy the part of it that says each key holder is going to keep is going to keep their their key in a particular way, or if so and so dies, mm -hmm. uh, so and so will have access. If you have four of seven, like what happens if five people are on a plane at the same time and they die? How do well, you? Well, then it's only a thousand ether per day for, for yeah. that on. So, like the, the interesting question is, right? Two thousand ether. I mean, yeah. each person can pull pull money so, out on a daily basis. Uh, there is, I would agree. Like the multi sig is fascinating and is useful. Like the governance that surrounds that control is off chain and is has the same human complexity that lawyers and business people have been dealing with forever. I don't I'm not sure the blockchain solves that. Or it, is it it's to. also so I would agree that a, a major financial institution is probably um, equally solid in implementing that agreement right now. But as Ethereum gets bigger uh, and more decentralized and more unstoppable, um, 10 months from now, 10 years from now, um, I, I think it's going to be much more solid than a financial institution populated by people. Let, let's not get too, too, too deep into multi six. <laughs> um, but transaction fees um, are mm -hmm. potentially um, still a way to measure success. So uh, maybe kind of going a little bit back from the, from the big 10 year, 20 year society question to like a short, shorter term, which mm -hmm. blockchain is successful, um, would you agree that the total amount of um, transaction fees uh, like paid on a blockchain is a good um, mm. indication for its success? Mm. An, an economist would definitely say it's the most uh, reliable and robust way to put a lower bound on how much value people are getting from the chain. It's, uh, I mean, the thing it doesn't tell you is it doesn't separate between categories of usage, but I mean, it does definitely tell you that someone valued the, transac the transaction being on chain enough to pay 64 cents for it. Yeah, and, and I think it's probably the most important metric as some of these blockchains um, inflation rates decline, right? So what does the uh, security model look like for Bitcoin when the inflation rate drops below 1%, right? You're going to need transaction fees if, if the miners yeah. under the current structure are going to be uh, incentivized the way they are today. Yeah. Um, Ethereum may be somewhat similar, even with the transition of proof of stake. Mm -hmm. um, but for non-money applications, I would argue that transaction fees or, or some type of network income is probably the only fundamental driver of value, otherwise most of these things are going to zero. Yeah, the one kind of problem I have with us uh, kind of socially agreeing to push that metric too hard is that it would incentivize like blockchain governance participants, and I'm using the term broadly, like including developers, including miners voting on the gas limit, like mining pools voting on Bitcoin block sizes, whatever. Um, it would incentivize these participants to basically care more about extra um, extracting as much value out of transaction fees as possible, as opposed to of maximum people's ability to use the chain. And yeah. when, you have, like, when you have a um, monopoly, which a blockchain kind of is, then like, those two goals are very often easily in conflict. Yeah, if that so, was an important metric uh, for deciding the um, value or popularity of blockchains, I, I think Tron's transaction fees would go through the roof um, you know, 10 minutes after that was decided. Oh yeah, I forgot to even talk about the possibility of mining pools paying to themselves. Yeah, EIP 1559 is going to fix that though. So, but, 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 but on, on, on that, um, uh, th that is an um, interesting point uh, on the uh, yeah, basically potential of, of um, rent extraction, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, how do, you, how do, how do we uh, prevent it? So if Ethereum is extremely successful and um, token securities, whatever stuff is all on there. Uh, how do you stop Ether holders from s at some point no longer uh, trying to keep uh, fees as, as low as possible, but like just starting to extract rent? I, I don't know that that's rent extraction just because especially as there's more alternative blockchains to build on, 
uh, competition is, is going to bring that into kind of a natural equilibrium, right? So it'll be part of the social contract of, of whichever the blockchain is that you're using that, you know, here's the equilibrium rate. Maybe it's, you know, 1% of total network transaction value is mm -hmm. going to be remitted to the stakers and, and the miners, validators, whatever, whatever you call them. But uh, if it drops too low, people are going to lose interest. The chain becomes less secure if it goes too high and it does look like rent-seeking behavior, then some developers might migrate to another chain to build their application. So I, I don't know, practically speaking, in a world in, you know, five years where there's half a dozen or more um, competitive smart contract platforms that that, that becomes a real issue. Um, and, uh, and aside from competition, I think another thing that's important is that this is a big part of why I favor a uh, kind of diverse and multi-stakeholder governance structure. So like if we just had coin votes as a way of deciding like pretty much any system parameters, then you know, yes, potentially like Eric Connor is gonna grow devil horns on his head and he is going to um, lead a campaign of um, all of the major ETH holders voting to push the, uh, gas, the gas limits down to extract uh, $50 uh, transaction fees like we saw in uh, Bitcoin one and a half years ago and we'll have that forever, but um, if you have a governance uh, structure that kind of more naturally incorporates uh, voice, voices from core developers, major application developers, stakeholders, users, then uh, that could be naturally mitigated more. And, and also, it, if a bad actor was able to um, capture the system in some way and, and seek rents on the system, um, We've been saying for a really long time that the mechanism of forking would keep us all honest and uh, um, if something um, untoward is going on on the platform, then the platform can be forked. Can it? I mean, I think it has become or it will become incredibly more difficult than like uh, two, two, two years yeah, ago. I mean, more difficult than seeing the rates uh, rise inappropriately? Forks uh, are hard now because if Ethereum forks now, then either on one of the two chains, uh, the price of DAI is going to drop to zero, or it stays at one on both chains, and then I have no idea what just I happened. I think you would actually see... Um, <laughs> I, I think there's a non-trivial chance that there would be legal action. I think somebody yeah. would probably go to federal court in New York or... I think so. ...and uh, try and stop it. There's already been... I'm dead serious. There's there are at least two uh, lawsuits out there where, um, and they're kind of silly requests, but there are at least two cases where um, plaintiffs have asked uh, courts to order forks. And I'm not sure that mm -hmm. a court is going to do that in those cases. But if you start talking about forking, what's the total value of uh, ETH of Ether at the moment? About, uh, Twenty billion. billion if, yeah. if you go to federal court and say somebody is going to do something to an asset that's worth $20 billion, a federal judge is going to listen to that. So I think that's sort of the, um, mm -hmm. that's sort of the external interesting, like to me as a lawyer, that's the interesting factor. Mm. How would a judge look at Ethereum in that context? Um, and I think actually, so one of so, the- So who does the judge tell to fork the, I'm not, the, I'm the actually, platform? I mean, that's a really good question. So like, what is it? Um, who is it? Do you, do you bring the exchanges in? Do you order the exchanges to do things? It's, I a, think lot, it's a lot of different independent actors. Absolutely. U ultimately, it's the miners. Um, sure. So but, I think. But the exchanges though, would have to list tokens. And we'll have one of the measures of success. I look at it as more legal certainty about those questions, as opposed to speculating, is mm -hmm. legal certainty that comes out of a certain amount of pain. I can't say from a volume transaction standpoint what what constitutes success. I would think that when we can answer with reasonable certainty what that means, what that will look like, is it, will judge throw it out, who will be named, what will the result be? That will be um, a measure of maybe we've moved one step uh, further across the chasm. If you can't be sued, you're sufficiently decentralized. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think this, this, this fork discussion is super interesting, and I think, well, Maker is obviously one, one reason why it's hard, and I, well, I basically I hope there will be many more, so ENS will hopefully be soon a, a, a big reason why it would be hard, because then you would need to decide, well, which, which chain um, does the name resolve. Uh, like security tokens, once they are there and pay out dividend, then the question is, do they pay out dividend to those tokens um, or those tokens? So overall, I can't, I, my sense is that forks will be very unlikely. 
Yeah, I mean, forking is uh, mutually assured destruction. The wonderful governance mechanism that's kept the world so nice and peaceful for 75 years. Yay. <laughs> So, but if we, if we assume... Do, do, you, do you think that's true even uh, as interoperability solutions mature, right? So the Cosmos, prob the parachains... The problem is that blockchains aren't just computation and data service providers, they're also registries. And it's that second thing that's a lot more that, that brings the thorniness. Well, how do you mean? Like, a blockchain just is used as the root registry of, like claims with, within the context of particular applications. And so if the thing splits in half, then it either survives, it either breaks on one side, um, in which case other things on that side that depended on it also break, or it survives on both sides, in which, um, in which case you get really weird economics happening. So, you know, and, like splitting definitely gets thornier the more of interdependency you have. Sure, so if it's ambiguous, I would agree that uh, uh, it's gonna be a an you know, impossible situation to, to work out, but if there is a clear uh, actor that has captured the system and all of the um, interacting participants on the system get together and say, hey, are you gonna switch? Or are you gonna switch? Or are you gonna switch? Then I could imagine a very clean transition. Um, these tokens represent uh, a US dollar in a bank account. Um, I'm running the company that makes that mapping. Um, we're choosing this chain. Yeah, I mean, just from looking at history with Bitcoin and its major fork and, and Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, I, I, I find it hard to believe that you'll see another major controversial fork of one of those chains. And instead, at least I believe it's more likely that specific applications or dApps will end up migrating chains. Do you think we won't see a major Bitcoin fork in the next year or two? People being people, I, mean, we, I they, would expect like... It's the, been happening. The one thing... Why, why would we see one? Because... because no, people, I, 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 no reason, no reason. <laughs> people and money equal conflict. Hmm. It's true. I mean, that's a long history of being a litigator tells me that. So I, it might not make sense. And I will also tell you that um, you learn this if you spend time as a lawyer. People do stupid things that are against their economic interest. And that's, uh, game theory tells you that as well. Uh, behavioral economics tells you that as well. So people don't always act in an economically rational fashion. So my prediction is, going, is that if there's a lot of money at stake and you have people who are ideological, you'll have forks, whether or not they make sense. Whether or not they're mutual assured destruction. Looking into my oracle. I have a few kind of short term, um, uh, shorter term like success metrics, and I would just throw them in and, and see whether that is that is a goal, um, or would you say that that's, that's a goal to optimize for? Or, like, question not like put all effort into optimizing this value, but whether it's a valid metric. So one is just how many people have uh, a wallet. Uh, so in 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 Bitcoin, uh, I sometimes hear the argument, uh, or well, it's obvious that. Not everyone on the planet could do a Bitcoin transaction. Um, so the argument is, well, that's not even needed. Uh, they can have layer two solutions, which are custodial exchanges, basically, in, 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 in that case. Um, so would you say it is an explicit goal to have as many as people as possible having a wallet or have, have being able to self custody. Sure, but it's a little bit complicated if you're measuring or comparing different systems because the Bitcoin addresses are essentially throwaway addresses when, when they're used and there's a change address. Uh, so um, just the comparison, the Ethereum addresses are, are much more persistent in, in their usage. I think if, thing, if mixers like Tornado Cash become more prevalent, then we could see most moving toward like one address equals one user per application. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was the key metric that I mentioned before. Hmm. How many people have $1,000 of crypto? How many people have 10000 and so on? And, and that's how you get a better sense for, you know, the, the wealth um, uh, distribution as well as uh, how many people are actually using this beyond just a novelty. Yeah, so uh, if you're looking for identity as represented by addresses, um, we could go up the stack a little bit and, and look at ENS or 
decentralized IDs, um, and when those things get persistently registered and they become utilized significantly, I think that would be an incredibly important metric. Maybe as a wallet question, um, how, do we, how do we improve it? Or kind of what is needed that more people uh, do it? Is it, uh, do they need more reasons to have it or should it be easier, both? Ethereum in, in general? Or, crypto well, in general. crypto and crypto wallets. I, I think just education in general, right? I, I think the, the UX still sucks for most applications, um, and most people don't really understand the messaging behind, uh, behind crypto, right? That's why Bitcoin has been so successful. It's extremely simple to understand. Yeah. Ethereum struggles with narrative, it, except for the narrative of if you want to build cool ap applications and you're a tinkerer and you're a developer, then all are welcome, right? And, and I think that's why you have the, the vibrant ecosystem of, of development and experimentation. Yeah, you need but from a user perspective, right, um, there is no narrative, right? So, so uh, if you're taking the approach that um, you can't trust your central bank, you can't trust currencies, you can't trust your, um, your, your bank where you're keeping your deposits, then open up a Bitcoin wallet, have a little bit just in case. That's yeah. an extremely simple narrative, and I think that most people uh, won't go the next step to educate themselves if they don't at least have that very simple starting point. People don't care about pipes, right? They want products. So I would, I would agree, sort of a, a product focus. You obviously need the pipes to have the product, but um, if I can drop, to, drop a little bit of a snippet of JavaScript into my web app so that I can do payments using Stripe, um, I don't necessarily care how that works, but I know that I don't have to deal with credit cards. If, when you have, I know that that's, that sort of functionality is being developed, but when you have that, um, I, don't, I don't really care how it works necessarily. I know that it's peer-to-peer, -peer, which is cool. It means I know that I can, I know that Ryan and I can enter into a contract that can't be broken, and I've seen that work in the past when you can start. I think that narrative, like a great story for me, and it's maybe if you've got a shovel, if you have a hammer, you see nails. Insurance policies that can't be broken. I mean, if you've ever had a claim with an insurance company, um, you know that they're much happier to take your premium than to pay claims. That sort of product, like check this out, like life insurance policy, when you die, it will be paid, and it's because of this blockchain stuff. I think that sort of, um, that to me is, it remains much more interesting than sort of pure currency payments, that programmability, when you can do that without having to understand solidity in it, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main challenge with this stuff is that basically any contracts that people make other than paying bounties for, uh, sol for solving math puzzles, like just has to have a real world component that blockchains by themselves can't read. So I think there are going to be applications that are less than 100% trustless and you'd expect them to be, those to be the majority, but it still needs to um, appreciate, like, understand when we're getting real gains that don't go quite that far and appreciate them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Then maybe I would uh, again repeat the question from last year and asking if we are like technologically uh, successful, um, what could go wrong um, mm -hmm. in any way? So, so what are risks basically of this technology or are there any? Um, all of the use cases that could actually reach uh, more, peop more people than uh, cypherpunks uh, get captured by semi-decentralized or pretends decentral uh, decentralized uh, centralized systems. Mm. Once again. <laughs> like basically all the use cases that aren't crazy cypherpunk stuff and that, act and that, that uh, seven billion people could legitimately be attracted to just get captured by m things that are more centralized than we would like. So basically the status quo, okay. I mean, instead of, like, I mean, I can um, allude to astrological signs, but um, no. <laughs> I don't know what that is. is that cryptocurrency? I mean, what is that? The astrological sign that you're referring to, or do you not want to say? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still thinking, or? No, no. no. Okay. No. Um, astrological signs. Your processing powers run a little faster, know, so I figured I could speak. Um, and maybe I'll piggyback off of what, what I think Joe was hinting at. I, I think one of the most terrifying things um, for any rational person 
that's in the ecosystem, certainly for regulators uh, and, and kind of existential type of threat to, uh, to the financial system if, if everything goes as planned and this really takes off, um, is will you have a private money supply, right? So whether it's ZK Snarks or Starks or any, you know, privacy enhancing technology that ultimately cloaks um, transactions and, and just who owns what and how money's moving. If that happens at massive scale and the market cap increases by orders of magnitude, now you have uh, a sizable chunk, if not the entire global economy running on uh, shadow finance. Uh, that that's completely untraceable, um, and I Wh think which is different from the way it works today. <laughs> the difference, <laughs> the difference is that we haven't figured out governance of these systems. So if you are fine with crypto ultimately being governed um, by the Ethereum Foundation and the major stakeholders and the major miners. Um, then that's one thing, but I, I think that as this technology grows more pervasive, as, as, as the impact on global finance becomes much more real, you're going to need actual governance, and uh, you're going to have governments talking about this, and there's going to be treaties, so, and so people will be involved in the in when the When monarchs were of running systems. the world, uh, the young upstarts were, were people who wanted democracy, uh, and so it takes time to, to figure out those systems, to mature those systems, to harden those systems so that they work, and uh, I think we're in the next phase of, uh, let's say, a, a governance phase shift. That transition happened before structured finance which is yeah. so it, itself it'll, it'll a big existential threat. Very complicated threat. and sophisticated and, and interesting. So like a, a really simplistic way of saying what could go wrong, um, I would say um, things that don't have an off switch. Complicated things that move value quickly that we don't understand, that don't have an off switch and that don't have governance that we understand. That's actually, that could be a problem. And if you're talking about like, let's think about this 20 years down the road, building stuff that you... So, so the internet doesn't have an off switch, really, except in, in some countries it may have an off switch. So, sorry, the, what, in, what? the internet, yeah. it, you know, globally it doesn't really have an off switch. Does the internet have failure modes? Is Facebook a failure mode? Is, um, is the exploitation of personal information a failure mode? If it is, that's just an application I mean, on this infrastructure uh, that... You know, regulators and society is ha are, are having a discussion about right now. Facebook can be turned off. Twitter can be turned off. Banks can reverse transactions. I'm not. I'm not making a normative judgment either. I see the benefits of um, of semi-autonomous or semi-autonomous financial structures. I get that, but you can still turn systems off. You can still reverse transactions. We still do understand how the financial pipes work. If we're talking about speculating, sort of a thought experiment, what could go wrong 20, 20 years down the road, we could have systems that we don't understand that are, I'm not saying it would be easy to turn Facebook off, but we could do it. Um, I'm not sure I like the idea of a world where we have systems that we can't turn off. This we, is we especially can't relevant. The, we, I mean, nobody grocks the internet completely and nobody can turn off the internet. This is especially relevant to this panel since we're probably all in the top 50 for the assassination markets, right? So, <laughs> well, at least, yeah, I'll speak for myself. I am, I'm just a simple country lawyer. So, Ryan, you, I'm not you, interesting. you, you brought up kind of the, the one direction that, that is um, the, the well, full, full privacy. Um, to some extent, there might also be the risk for the opposite direction, like kind of no privacy whatsoever and everything transparent, everything uh, on the blockchain, all your f financial transactions uh, visible by Libra maybe, I don't know. Um, is, is that a risk or do you think privacy technology is strong enough that this will definitely win? I mean, I, I personally have a little bit more comfort over the middle ground, right? So using things like uh, But can we achieve tumblers it? I mean, like and, what's that? Can we achieve the middle ground? I mean, I guess everyone agrees that uh, the middle ground... Well, on, on the one hand, if everything is anonymous by default, the entire system is anonymous by default, that, that seems like uh, it's going to be too scary to get mass adoption. And, and in fact, you're already starting to see some countries that are just out, outlawing uh, things like Zcash um, just preemptively. Um, I think 
the other thing that you have to keep in mind, especially during this transition period, is, is how will you possibly work uh, as an on and off ramp to legacy financial system and, and kind of the real world, if you will, if you don't have some ability to follow financial regulations and you can't you know, point to at least who's acquiring uh, these assets, even if they then take it and put it into their own hardware wallet and transact it elsewhere and move it through tumblers. So um, that to me, uh, I, I get a little bit more confidence that if you can regulate the edges and the, the system kind of in macro is, is somewhat transparent, that's probably a good thing, but in micro, it becomes much, much more difficult to trace any individual's transaction. I think that's kind of the holy grail in the middle ground that, that yeah, ideally we'd like to see. There is historical precedent for middle grounds uh, we're working between basically regulation and quote crypto and anarchic technologies working reasonably well. I'd point to copyright enforcement as being number one. And I'd even claim, and definitely strongly claim the middle ground as superior to copyright people being able to do whatever they want. And, and there's arguments to be made it's superior to, to no copyright existing at all as well. So such things have, have happened. So I think there's going to forever be a tension between um, transactions that are associated with an identity and transactions that you effectively can't associate with an identity or, or are pseudonymous. Um, I think we're going to see it uh, with respect to cryptography and regulation and other forces in our technology. Um, but I think it it will go beyond our technology if we end up um, building perfect uh, systems for hiding identity. Um, somebody's going to build a technology, maybe it's uh, nano drones that, that fly around and, and see the, the keystrokes that we type in, into our keyboards and record those things and report them back. And so um, there will always be people who want to do stuff um, in an undisclosed fashion, and there will always be people who want to see what they're doing. Then Sleep maybe tight. Coming back to the uh, original uh, question uh, and asking, yeah, again, about the positive case. So and, and trying to, to point it down to a metric about society. Um, so what is the metric uh, for society that you would like to see um, well, improved uh, by blockchain in, 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 in 10 to 20 years. And if you don't want to point it down to a metric, then maybe just, just or what's your biggest hope maybe for, for the technology? Human happiness. Human happiness, right. And, uh, well, then I guess how would blockchain improve human happiness? I mean, it's, it's a tool, right? Um, I think it depends on the people who are building with it. I think the mistake is to assume that it's a... Um, Look, you can build a building with a hammer, you can also knock somebody over the head. The question is gonna be the intentions of the people who are using it and the products they're trying to build. Uh, we don't know if it'll ultimately be a, a net be benefit or a net detriment. I think we can reasonably expect that it's here, though. Um, so that's up to the people in this room. In a yeah. Pro problem is it's hard to quantify happiness objectively. Uh, so I, I will go for a much broader uh, economic and political agency for people around the world. And I think we can get there because we're, we've built this technology that enables us to build um, collective collaborative systems. I, I've been calling them um, topical global villages where you get a uh, group of people together, you build a blockchain-based system, you define some goals, you define membership rules, you raise money, you execute the work on the blockchain, and uh, it can be um, in pursuit of cure of a disease or, or some other um, shared set of goals. Um, I think we're going to be living, working, playing on these systems, and I think we're going to, each of us will have stake in those systems, we'll probably own those systems through token ownership and staking, and we'll probably need that ownership in order to participate in different roles. And so we'll be voting and working on these systems. Yeah, so, so in, in, in this direction, so uh, that, that was kind of my metric I chose last year was um, the, the, the number of things you are, like, let's say, interacting on a, on a daily basis, so the, the whatever, the coffee shop you're going to, and kind of, uh, increasing um, yeah, the number of things you're interacting with where you also have a stake in. So you have some form um, 
of, of ownership. That, that would be for me kind of one of those metrics. Maybe Vitalik. I, I like the phrase economic and political empowerment. And well, I think you might you said agency, but empowerment is good too. And I, yeah, in in general, the I, I feel like the ultimate goal here is to allow uh, people and communities of people to be able to uh, form institutions, applications, structures, whatever of, of different kinds, whatever you call them, to uh, help them shape and shape and improve their destinies. And that's a yeah, I mean, a very broad and hard to measure, but also a very powerful thing. Yeah, so sounds, like sounds another way, happiness basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. it's it's a different. Actually, it's it's more specific than happiness because um, happiness can uh, potentially be provided by a uh, big brother god that doesn't give you any choice in how you get it. But so an another way to empowerment to can't. think about it uh, and measure it potentially is to think about how much of an ownership or stakeholdership society uh, we develop, and so. Um, if I have economic and political agency in these systems that I live within, then I'm effectively an owner of those systems, and, and it's, it's really great that we're calling uh, this next phase of evolution of blockchain systems staking systems, and, and that we're, we're staking assets and, and our time and attention. Um, as uh, we move into a much broader ownership society. Uh, we'll have many more people uh, with skin in the, in the game, many more people uh, grounded in, um, in things they care about. So many people will be working to uh, protect and preserve and to, to grow those things rather than break those things down. I'd like to see everybody own between $1,000 and $10,000 worth of Bitcoin and Ether going back to my metric that I think will lead to 7. success. 7.6 billion multiplied by 1 to 10,000 between 7.6 trillion and 76 trillion market cap. <laughs> On the low end? <laughs> On the I, low end, that's gold. On the high end, that's a replacement for sovereign currencies. Depends how many times Bitcoin forks, though. I said, I said Bitcoin <laughs> and Ether, Joe. I said Bitcoin and Ether. Mm. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. So I think we will open it uh, for a short Q&A. So we, will, we can have a couple of, um, of questions. And I see, oh, we need a mic. Uh, I see one, one right here. Hi, guys. Um, I want to ask your opinion about the new DAO movements and specifically the for-profit DAOs. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any like realistic chance that it could work? Not not Moloch DAO, but the new ones. Um, I so I haven't researched the specific uh, and, uh, specific structures called for-profit DAOs, but. And I mean, honestly, I I've been liking the word DAO less and less because it has like a, it has a very specific connotation about this kind of singleton thing that everyone works through, as opposed to kind of more broadly just thinking about like how can we use smart contracts. So, like one, ex and I think there are a lot definitely ways in which smart contracts can be used to improve like different profitable business activity, I and mean, I, I suggested uh, DAICOs about a, um, about a year and a half ago as one possibility. Um, more recently, there was this post on ETH research about something called public interest projects, where basically people stake money and then the like, interest from putting that money in compound automatically gets put to whatever projects you support and you can take the money out at any time, so you're kind of never risking your principal, which is um, kind of... DAACO squared in some sense, and I find that interesting. So, I mean, I definitely support kind of broad innovation in these kinds of structures, and I think some of them could be really useful. So I, I would say that the concept of the DAO is interesting as a protocol governance mechanism, not as a replacement for an, an entity itself. So DAO projects that are not trying to swallow the ocean and uh, as a consequence drowning or becoming the ocean, but pick specific elements of corporate governance that don't work and iterate on those, I think, um, like the notion of sort of automating governance issues, that's another, for me, example of how do you use smart contract technology to automate performance. Those are the projects that are interesting, not the ones that try to recreate everything. 
Yeah, we're, we're going to have uh, so many protocol-based open platforms or, or these topical global villages um, that I described earlier, and we're going to need governance. Um, Early on, uh, some of us were using the term decentralized organizations uh, as distinguished from decentralized autonomous organizations. A decentralized organization has people in governance of it. A decentralized autonomous organization, you snip the cords um, and the people aren't really in control and it's operating by some, um, some logic that you can't adjust anymore. Uh, we may, we'll probably see some of those things at, at some point in the future. So I, I've never been a fan of the term DAO. Um, but uh, we're seeing interesting ones pop up now uh, for charitable um, allocations and uh, I think we'll see lots of for-profit versions of them. Um, somewhere out there, there might be a person named Aaron Wright who runs a project called Open Law. Uh, the Open Law team has just put together a framework for uh, legal DAOs. Uh, they call them LAOs, legal autonomous organizations. And um, for your protocol-based open platform, you can now talk to Aaron and have a a fully legal um, blockchain-based uh, decentralized organization to, to govern your system um, based in Delaware currently, but they're trying to figure out other jurisdictions also. Uh, quick. Yeah. So quick question regarding the mixers and other protocols that are being built. Uh, so if we go ahead and launch the mixers on the main net, what are the, as a company or as an individual, what are the, what are the challenges you will have to face from the government or anywhere else? Technically, it's doable, but I'm worried about the other pieces. So, any advice to that? Um, wait. So the question was like challenge, like, like governance or challenges from the government. 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 Um, yeah, so I mean, this gets into this kind of area of law where, like, on the one hand, there's this kind of long standing precedent that you kind know, of code is free speech, and if you write code and you pu and publish it, then there's kind of free speech protections around it. But on the other hand, like, the extent to which you can lean on that is not infinite. <laughs> right, so there's a difference between writing stuff um, on paper on your computer and and instantiating it or making it actually perform and do stuff. I'm not gonna provide a legal opinion about the legality of mixers, but like creating a thing is different than running a thing. And if you operate a mixer and you're involved in somehow in money transmission, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll be yeah. talk to a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, which is different from using a thing. Yeah. Uh, sure. So I could set up a, a mixer uh, based on code that you wrote, and if nobody ever used it, um, I probably wouldn't be party to any sort of illegal activity, but if I facilitated illegal activity, um, so, so it's really about um, what the actions are um, in specific jurisdictions. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my understanding is that like, things that give you more risk, one is actually running a, actively running a server, um, another is making money from it. Yes, I mean, obviously if you're profiting from something that um, looks dodgy in the eyes of the law. It's um, maybe there's more risk than not profiting. It, it really, I mean, it's such an it depends. It's it's hard to answer that question with any. Um, and it'll give you any certainty. And if I run a mixer that is designed to anonymize ownership of game tokens potentially, so if there's if there's a real good usage for it that's not illegal, and somebody happens to like clean their value token somehow, um, I might not be liable, potentially. Yeah, so I think um, why a lot of, of, a lot of people like us find the space interesting is because we're very frustrated with the legacy financial system and we think that it extracts a lot of value from the real economy for the actual benefit it brings, like moving assets from A to B or acting as a registry. Um, so I see blockchain is like Ethereum, like a place where you can really design new systems to minimize this, um, this extraction of value from the economy. But do you think that 
um, talking about business models, do you think we as developers are kind of like altruistically making the world a better place or do you think there's actually a place there to actually also for companies to make profit out of this minimization of the abstraction of, of, of value? So the reason financial institutions are able to make money, um, um, inordinate amounts of money perhaps, is because they are um, centralized intermediaries and uh, they've imposed themselves into a situation and they, they maximize um, the value that they take in any transaction and uh, the value of uh, providing those services in a much more decentralized context is so that you can provide uh, intermediation um, but in a much more competitive landscape so that there you can't really engage in rent-seeking behaviors. Uh, decentralized markets are, um, or these protocols will be a really good way of determining um, or do, doing price discovery around the value of intermediation because intermediation is often very valuable whether it's done by a smart contract or a banker. Uh, it's just a question of um, paying the correct price for it. Um, in terms of whether uh, developers are doing it uh, for altruistic reasons or profit-seeking reasons or both, uh, I, I think you'll get a, a pretty broad spectrum. Vitalik, do, do you have an answer to this question? Because you have sometimes been critical about like projects using a token or something like that. So what is what, what should be the business model? It's very case-specific. Because, and like this is, like the problem is, right, that like even going more broadly, that is, is as we enter the um, information age, this uh, e kind of traditional economic model of like I build a thing that's useful to you if you have it and you buy it because you wants to have it, doesn't really work so well because the, like, a large portion of the things that are getting built are fundamentally partially or fully public goods. And so you're creating things where if you try to gatekeep it, then you're basically destroying a whole, a, a large portion of the value. Um, and so, like, because the economic system itself doesn't create this uh, this nice direct link where you give someone a thing and they give you uh, they give you money because they, because they want the thing, you have to rely on business models that rely on something connected to the thing that the thing that you're building. And sometimes these business like. This creates mismatches, so like uh, advertising revenue being the example that people talk about the most, but also it does mean that the, there's not going to be a universal answer that covers every sector. And like, sometimes creating a coin is actually the right thing. Sometimes creating a company that does some things but also sells uh, some things is the right, is the right thing. It, sometimes like just being a kind of charity and accepting grants from other people is pretty much the only kind of pure way to do it. It, it, it really depends on the case. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Was it me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the economy, the economic, economically inequality is increasing a lot currently in the world. Mm -hmm. And you said before that you hope that blockchain would help improve economically agency and empowerment. Mm -hmm. But do you believe that blockchain will help in, uh, reduce economically inequality or increase it even further than today? So maybe to put even more uh, into the question, right now the uh, inequality in blockchain is probably larger than in the society? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Blockchain is not going to solve world hunger. It's not going to solve inequality. It's a, it's a tool. I mean, it, it depends on how people use it. I don't see anything about the technology that makes it more or less likely that the world will be a more just, fair place that will allow people to have more equal distribution of, of wealth. That's I mean, reducing barriers between countries is probably the, is one of the bigger things. There. But also, sometimes reduced barriers makes people hate each other more. I mean, it's... It, it depends on what you build. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm being cynical. I just I don't think it's a panacea. So I, I definitely believe that uh, having a better trust foundation, having reduced barriers, um, having greater collaboration platforms um, will lead, uh, as I 
um, indicated earlier to greater agency, economic and political for most people. And, and so uh, I do believe that uh, while pretty much all systems, including blockchain systems, start out with the value extremely concentrated amongst uh, um, the one person or the two people that starts a company or, or something like that, um, we are achieving greater decentralization in our ecosystem. And um, as this stuff actually starts to get used, uh, I think the value is going to um, spread out uh, probably better um, than in the previous technological revolution where um, the technologies that uh, were brought forth enabled uh, the people in control of those organizations to, to stack value higher than it's ever been stacked before. I, I think this time will be different, to, to use a, a phrase. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think uh, blockchain is a unique mechanism that will enable this. Yeah, I think in a, a healthy capitalist system, uh, it's not a bad thing if inequality goes up, provided that the bottom quartile of people have a higher standard, standard of living than they did before whatever the disruptive technology was that, that entered. So this has been um, you know, pretty consistent with every major um, technology shift. And, and, and during the transition, uh, it can get a little messy and it can get chaotic and, and doesn't always look that good for the, the people that are disrupted, if, especially if they can't change jobs quickly enough. But the end result over time is, is that standards of, of living writ large uh, end up increasing. Um, I'll give a, a book recommendation, The Rational Optimist uh, by Matt Ridley. If, if, if anyone hasn't uh, read it, I, I'd encourage you to because there's a lot of doom and gloom and, and, and we tend to focus on like, you know, what are all the things that could go wrong? But generally speaking, um, living standards globally for centuries now has continued to get better and better and technology has been a driver of that and capitalism has been a driver of that. I, I think I just, I just have to add here that, well, I'm still naive and optimistic about it, so I still think uh, um, stuff like yeah, universal basic income and inequality, or basically this technology could uh, reduce inequality. <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel like um, by today's metrics, I, I think things are going to get better in terms of um, how wealth is distributed in the world. But uh, I also think with uh, different technologies, we're going to get to the point where we do have all of our physical needs met, our, our survival needs, uh, and we start to change what we value in society. If we start to configure our uh, institutions, whether they're corporations or, or other, to um, maximize mental and physical health or societal health rather than uh, GDP. Um, we're, I'm not talking next year, but maybe uh, 20 years from now. There, you know, we're in the U.S. and and I was just in South Korea. A huge focus on on social value as generated by corporations. And uh, there's a big company in South Korea that has 50% of the bonuses. Uh, paid to executives based on how much they're driving social value. So um, I think the the discussion or, or the metrics have a chance of changing over time. Okay, we are already getting lots of messages here that we are way over time. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks all to you, uh, to you and thanks a lot for the questions.